Hello, yes, welcome. My name is Jason Schwab. I am a producer at Restaurant Spaces, and this is episode eight of Disrupt, uh, which is our little LinkedIn live show. But what do we do here on Disrupt? Well, you know, we actually got the idea for this thing back in the pandemic. We're still in a pandemic, actually, uh, when we were kind of dwelling in a lot of disruption. There was a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion, which was kind of scary. And to be honest, though, and as you guys know, this is where a lot of great ideas and innovation is born. But to be able to do that, you've got to expose yourself to new ways of thinking, new ideas, which then might get your thinking to change uh, after you've been exposed to those things. So that's what we want to do here with Disrupt. We go out into the industry, we find someone who's doing some cool things, some innovative things. Maybe their thinking is a little different to, uh, to your thinking. And maybe you'll walk away with a different take on how you do your thing. Uh, and our guest today is someone who I'm sure is going to be able to do that. His name is Jeff Chandler. He has had a string of leadership positions uh, in the restaurant industry. Right now, though, he is the CEO of Hop Dotty Burger Bar, which is a fast casual chain out of Austin, Texas, which I'm sure most of you in our audience will have heard of before. Um, They've been doing some really cool things through the pandemic, some things that they were forced to do because of the disruption that was happening. They introduced some new initiatives. They introduced some new things, in including this new thing, which is, uh, what is this, like the slushy bagged take home cocktails or something like that, which is awesome. Uh, but they've also been doing a lot of things operationally uh, and uh, upping the convenience for their customers and, and improving that experience as well, which is exactly what we're going to talk about with Jeff in just a second. So let's let's bring him live. Let's stop talking and let's do the talk. Jeff Chandler, how are you doing? Can you can you hear me? Can you read me? Um, absolutely, Jason. Thank you for the great intro. I appreciate it. No, no, not a problem. Are you uh, you calling from Austin today? I see you've You've got your hat in the background. I'm a bit, a bit disappointed you're not wearing it, but... Uh, you, you, you can't be an official Texan without a hat. Yeah, I'm calling from Austin, Texas today, and it's a, it's a great day. Oh, good to hear. Good to hear. Well, look, thanks for joining us, Jeff. Uh, and yeah, look, I, I just want to jump straight into it. Like I mentioned just now, I'm pretty sure our audience is familiar with Hop Dotty, but for those who don't know what Hop Dotty is, what the hell is Hop Dotty? You know, I was, I was actually thinking the other day, it kind of sounds like a verb. Like uh, it might be something you might say, like, man, I could really hop dotty a burger right now, or you know, like, man, let's go over and hop dotty that car, take it for a spin. But I know it's a noun, and I know it's not a verb, Jeff. So why don't you tell us what hop dotty is? Well, maybe we should start referring to it as a verb. I like that a lot. Um, look, hop dotty, <laughs> strange, unique name for a little bit of a unique, different concept. We 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 play in a very crowded better burger space. And so, you know, I think differentiation, how do we stand out is really, everyone's trying to figure that out. Our founders had some brilliance in the name early on and they wanted something different. They wanted something unique. They wanted something that, you know, people would remember if they heard it once. And so they came up with Hop Dottie, which really at the end of the day is a perfect union between beer and burgers. Hop is for hops, the, the flower used to give beer its, its pungent effervescent uh, smell and uh, Dottie, which is a nickname given for a Scottish Angus cattle. They call them little Dotties. So it was Hop Dottie was born. Wow. Okay. There's, there's a lot of facts packed into that. Would you say <laughs> Dottie is a type of Scottish Angus beef? Yeah, they, it's, a nick, it's a nickname given to, uh, you know, their, their breed of cattle over there, uh, part of the Angus herd, but they would call them Dotties, little Dotties. Ah. All right. So, I, I, I was about to attempt a Scottish accent. That's not a good <laughs> idea. Um, okay, really interesting. Well, th well thanks for, the, for the, the background there, Jeff. Um, and I guess, you know, where are you at in terms of locations right now? What's in your portfolio? I know you were driving around uh, Houston the other day on a bit of a scouting mission. So what's the, uh, what's the outlook for growth like moving forward next five years as well and then maybe beyond that? Yeah, look, Hop, Hop Dottie today uh, stands at 32 units. Uh, 
We are heavily positioned in Texas, but we have restaurants in California, Colorado, Arizona, and Tennessee. Uh, we are looking to rapidly grow in the state of Texas, uh, kind of rounding out our core base. So between you know Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, you know we think that we could probably close to double in size. Uh, and a lot of it, uh, a lot of our bullish kind of um, uh, pro progress going forward really was born out of COVID and some of the innovations that we made through COVID that I think has positioned us better than ever to, to really grow and expand and, uh, and, and be successful. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, and you, you brought up the pandemic then. Uh, I do want to talk about that because I know you guys have been up to some stuff. So why don't you run us through, you know, once the pandemic hit, what happened? What was that rocking the boat like for you guys? Yeah. And then what was the focus moving forward uh, through to now when, you know, everything's kind of coming back online and, uh, you know, there's a lot of labor issues as well. So how's the pandemic kind of spun you in a different direction? Yeah, it, it really has truly been a kind of our slingshot moment that we feel that it has propelled us forward in so many ways. And, you know, when things first broke out, we took an approach where we wanted to run to the bottom of the hill as fast as we can. And we were fur fast, furious and aggressive. We closed 18 of our locations overnight. Um, we left the, the locations open that we had the highest kind of volume in third party delivery business, which we at the time thought would be, you know, kind of our only saving grace. And what we realized is that our, our curbside pickup, our, our really our off premise business in general uh, was very robust and gained extraordinary momentum and speed throughout, you know, the first few months of COVID. And so we quickly reopened back all of those 18 shuttered restaurants and brought team members back. And so within three months, we had every restaurant back open and running and, you know, our business continued to flourish. We, we went from a traditionally a 12% off-premise percentage of our business. We, gosh, I mean, everybody saw this, but we went to 70%. And, and today we're around 25% of our volume still coming in. So really double what it was before. And, and we've learned a lot through the process. Yeah. So why don't you talk me through that then? So in terms of boosting, you know, you had to jump on to off premise and really make that experience fuller than what it was. So I guess from a design perspective and at your locations, what, what have you been doing or maybe what are you still doing now to optimize that experience for people who are accessing you guys via digital channels? Right. Yeah, a really good um, question and, a, and a, a very important point for us. Our, our three brand pillars really have always been around quality, uniqueness and variety. And I think one of the things we've learned through this experience is needing to be more aggressive on convenience. And so we're adding convenience is really our fourth brand pillar going forward. And I think we've made a lot of significant strides to be more relevant from a convenience perspective. So gosh, what does that mean? Um, developing our curbside technology, you know, how do we efficiently and effectively handle, you know, the volume of folks coming through that channel and do it in a way that is, you know, a unique, seamless, frictionless, um, process. And so, you know, threading in technology to communicate with the guests when they arrive to the signage component, to designating, you know, space for people to pull up and temporarily park or to drive through and how we approach that internally, um, we feel really good about. And so, you know, we have made physical modifications at the restaurants all where we could, where we had actual physical assets to work with so that we have more of a dedicated curbside we actually have a couple of mobile order pickup windows that, surprise, surprise, are now some of our busiest restaurants. Uh, and so, you know, kind of further validating that people are looking for the convenience option. Um, and so I, it definitely is part of our future for sure. You know, we're going to go through a design prototype process to, to really uncover and flush that out. But, you know, like most, you know, curbside and, and pickup windows are here to stay. And, um, and we think that can be a, a very profitable segment of the business for us. And we think we can do it in a way that's relevant to our, our guests. Yeah, interesting there, a jump to 70%, now back to 25%. Uh, and I guess it will be interesting to see how that levels out. Interesting too, what you just said about the mobile pickup windows. 
and you said, you know, surprise, surprise, they're now the busiest locations. What came first, the, the, the digital ordering or once you put the window in, did, did you notice a difference there or when you when you're trying to push more through those channels? How, how did that work? Yeah, it was the digital ordering that we really started with. And, you know, we realized that people live on these things and we needed to make that intuitive, seamless, you know, from the minute you think of enjoying HopDotty, whether you are looking for an off-premise experience, a delivery experience, or an on-premise experience, you know, really, really figuring out how to leverage these to their fullest. And so, you know, very thankful that uh, we were able to innovate and incorporate that in. And, you know, we feel right now it's not perfect, but, you know, it is, it's fairly seamless. Uh, and so that was one component of it that I think drove that. And the mobile order pickup window, you know, I think people were looking for that. And what we had realized is we didn't properly sign and, you know, there's, there's wayfinding signage and then there's kind of brand reinforcement signage. And we really didn't think intentionally about either of them. And so what COVID forced us to do was to really make that more intuitive, more pronounced. You know, one of our, uh, our sister companies through a, a common ownership is Velvet Taco. And I, I'm, you know, I'm very impressed with what Velvet does with their mobile order pickup windows, if anyone has seen those. But, you know, we tried to emulate and learn from them and, and learn how they did it. But um, technology helped. The communication piece really helped um, so that we could communicate effectively with guests and they didn't have to get out of their cars and walk in and say, hey, is my order ready? Um, and, you know, with the drive up window, the, the whole point was is to keep keep cars flowing. Um, they can come in and check in. They scan a QR code. They can go park anywhere. We get their phone number. We can communicate effectively with them. Hey, your order's ready. They can swing back around without getting out of their car, pick it up, and drive. Perfect. Yeah, it sounds like you are really kind of you've been ironing out the the processes there. And I yeah, I like what you t mentioned there, the intentionality of it. Uh, and I wouldn't want to follow up on that, but before I do, I just want to say if anyone out there has any questions for Jeff uh, that you'd like me to throw at him, then just throw it up in the chat over here, and uh, I'll uh, get to them in just a bit. But Jeff, coming back to this idea of intentionality, th that wasn't the yeah. only thing that you guys had to shift and change when you went through the pandemic. And I know, you know, you've always had this, uh, you know, handmade mentality and everything was handmade before that. What, what's changed now? How has the back of house changed uh, to be able to accommodate some of those uh, new shifts that you've made? If you could just talk about that briefly. Well, I think one of the bets we made early on uh, was this notion that uh, employment was going to continue to be challenging, right? It was challenging back then because of COVID and fear of working and so forth. And gosh, today we find ourselves and everyone is in, in this battle for talent. And so we made an intentional shift uh, really to lessen our dependency on people. And when I say that, I've got to say that with a caveat because we're in the people business at the end of the day. I mean, our core capacity and our core competencies, rather, uh, not in producing great burgers and fries. Our core competency is building great teams, right? And it's the it's the culture and the excitement, and enthusiasm that our people bring to our business. But we realized we had to reduce our dependency on people, and so with that notion, we really looked to drive unnecessary labor out of our models uh, and out of our business. And so, what does that mean? It means that we went from this made from scratch with our own hands in our kitchens, which, you know, was uh, people took pride in it. So we had to be mindful of that. But there was tons of inconsistencies with it. I mean, we were grinding whole muscle proteins, eight different proteins. We were putting it through our own grinding machines and then we had to sanitize our grinding machines. And we had to make sure when we were doing our burger patty that we were putting, you know, 22 percent fat in. And, you know, and, and we were paying people 15 to 20 dollars an hour to try to be butchers in our places. And and so what we ended up getting is an awesome product when it was done right. But consistency for us was a challenge. And that's just one example. We did it with baking buns and all of our produce and so forth. And, and so we changed that to this kind of more of a, a mantra of sourcing and specifying products to our fanatical standards that we're, we might pay a little bit more for in, in terms of cost of goods, but it's going to improve our quality and drive consistency and, and, and really help us eliminate that dependency on human labor 
so that we can reinvest some of that human labor more intentional. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, really making sure that that human hospitality touch point within our four walls from an on-premise and off-premise experience was flourishing. And I'll tell you now today, like there is a people want human hospitality, you know, and it's a part of why people go to restaurants is to enjoy the, the community, the camaraderie and that communalism that comes from sharing, breaking bread together. And so we realized we needed to be intentional with that. And so we did a lot of work to kind of reposition our labor from the back more into the front. And then even in the front, being more specific about those hospitality touch points so that it wasn't just a, a, a catch all. Right. Okay. I guess two things then on, on the back of that. Can you, can you just rattle off a few maybe equipment changes you maybe made in the back of the house to, to accommodate that? And then you mentioned changing the focus there with your front of house staff. How, how, have, you, how have you changed the structure of your staffing? And, and uh, I know you've been doing work on just your managers as well in terms of helping that process and putting that emphasis on hospitality. Yeah. So, uh, you know, from back of the house perspective in terms of technology and equipment, you know, one of the things we realized really early on is we needed to improve the consistency of our cook times and increase the ticket time, you know, speed up the ticket times. And we needed to improve our throughput. And we had, you know, we had some some roadblocks. And one of the things that we did is innovated with a clamshell griddle. So a clamshell griddle for us, we traditionally are a flat top grill uh, burger cooking um, restaurant. And we moved to a clamshell that cooks from the top and the bottom. We went from a six and a half minute cook time to a two minute, five second cook time. Um, and that burger is cooked the same every time. It's got a great you know, crisp on the outside, perfectly juicy and tender inside. I mean, so it was a transformational game changer for us. And what we saw is we, that also helped speed up our, our throughput. So clamshell griddle was one. We made some changes to our baking procedures um, so that we can continue to bake throughout the day. But we started, and we start now with a, a preformed puck uh, instead of making the, the dough from scratch. And those are just two examples of some of the equipment changes in the kitchen. On the front of the house side, I will tell you some of those intentionality in how we weave hospitality into it was just, you know, uh, identifying the key, whether it was friction points or uh, hospitality moments that would make a difference in that guest dining experience. So, you know, um, we're right now fast casual, you order at the counter, you know, those folks needed to be, they needed to be excellent, they need to be great. Um, in, and so we we put more effort and intentionality to hire better people, pay them more, because that was a high critical touch point. Secondarily, you know, we we run food to tables, and so we're not full service, but we kind of take this attitude of, hey, once you've sat down, we're going to deliver your food, and it's full service from here. So we kind of rethought our whole service model internally, so that we could specifically touch tables. Uh, in more meaningful time periods, that two minute two by check back, right? And then the, the close at the end of the, the their meal. And so just being more mindful with human hospitality labor, specifically in those three points. Really great. And thanks for the rundown there, Jeff. I, you, you guys have been, you've been busy. And I like that. I like that kind of focus on intentionality and, and having your mindset in that kind of place. I, I do want to jump, we, we, time is going real quick, Jeff. Uh, I do want to jump to some audience questions that we have uh, coming in right now, though. Uh, this one's from Robert Packer, who is the president of Rayado Group. I'm probably saying that wrong. Uh, but he asks, you know, how has site selection changed for you and your team as you grow your footprint, <laughs> either in terms of location placement or store layout? So we learned that we can um, populate a market more densely. Right. We, uh, we we've engineered our model so that our the, the, the weekly sales criteria to make the same return. We've improved that through a lot of these engineered results. So so what we thought we could possibly do six restaurants in Austin before. Now we think we can do 10 restaurants in Austin. Um, so that's one part of it. Yes, it's changed site selection quite dramatically. Um, business has shifted kind of away from downtown urban cores, and I think that'll come back. But, you know, the suburbs have been performing better. So, you know, we, we, we are focused more on the suburbs. We're focused more on freestanding locations with a mobile order pick, pickup window. Surprise, surprise. Probably everybody is looking for that, but, but we're no different. Um, you know, and the Hopdotty part of the brand, it's, it's cool, it's fun, it's funky, you know, so we also like to go into those very walkable, 
densely populated neighborhoods um, where we can capture that local community foot traffic and, and vibe. South Congress in Austin is obviously our flagship, it's our OG. And so kind of emul emulating South Congress, if anyone are familiar with South, South Congress. Yeah, that, that's the location that just has people out the door to the corner. Um, very interesting. Th thanks, Jeff. And I've got another one here from uh, Gina from Connect Source Consulting. And she asks, um, would you consider hiring at-risk juvenile children or second chance employees, uh, like what Chad Hauser does at Cafe Momentum to assist in making a difference in local communities? Absolutely, 100%. You know, part of what makes Hop Dowdy different is, you know, we put an eye in team. You know, a lot of us played sports growing up and our coaches always told us, hey, there's no eye in team. It's about the team, not the individual. We take the different approach. Like there is an eye team and that's the individual, the individual and the individuality that comes with that. Part of what we think makes a great guest experience is just hiring authentic, real people and letting them be themselves. So we don't train to a certain script. We don't, you know, make kids wear khakis in a button down. Like we're, we're just we're, we're, we're real people and we, we try to get the best out of people by letting them be themselves. And, you know, we refer to this in a very loving way. So please, no offense is taken by this, but we take the mantra that we succeed and thrive by hiring from the Island of Misfit Toys. What I mean by that is a lot of folks are overlooked because of past mistakes they've made or because of their appearances. We think quite the opposite. Like we think what counts is on the inside, regardless of what you look or, you know, maybe some of the poor choices you've made in the past. So absolutely we would. Awesome, great. That's that's a really great approach, and uh, thanks for. I, I could I could tell the passion in your voice. So, um, thanks for outlining. It. Thanks for the question, Gina. And just one last one from the audience here, Jeff, uh, from JP at Oxblue. Uh, and I know you have locations outside of Texas already, but when are you going to open locations outside of Texas? Is the question. So I guess JP wants a burger where he's living. I guess <laughs> probably a year and a half to two years. Uh, we definitely will go to a new market. We can't fulfill our ambitious growth um desires in texas alone like i said we, we probably can do another 26 27 restaurants we think in texas so it will force us to backfill in our existing markets california colorado arizona tennessee beyond that i would say that you know we like the atlanta market a lot uh we like the tri-state dc area a lot we like chicago i mean so I, I think for us it's it's really building a, a solid core first and then branching out a couple of years Right. Okay. There you go, JP. You'll have to visit Texas in the meantime. Um, but <laughs> there's a roadmap to your burger. Uh, and, and look, Jeff. We, again, like we're running out of time. Uh, not much. Uh, not much I can left. I can ask you, but I. I do want to ask you. Uh, you know, we we're in this period of kind of mayhem. We've just come out of this period, uh, and you know, you guys have been making a lot of changes. You've shown great leadership there, especially from taking something you know a handmade mindset to sort of really streamlining it and, and building more consistency there. As we come out of this period and, you know, we're coming out of the tunnel into the light and people are kind of thinking we're back to normal again. I wonder what you might have to say to restaurant operators, you know, having come through uh, COVID now and, and uh, you know, this idea that we are going back to normal, what would you say to that in, uh, in terms of constantly adopting a mindset of change? Yeah, be open-minded, truly being open-minded, question everything. Uh, don't be afraid to make radical changes. Don't be afraid to question the status quo. You know, slay any sacred cow you can find and really, really challenge that. You know, people will accept change if they know the why and, and involve people, involve your team, involve your community in the why. Not that you're ever going to get to consensus with anything, but it's important to involve people and to listen to people, to hear a different perspective so that when you make that, when you chart that course and you make that decision, you know, they know, they're involved, they're bought off, they, they buy in uh, because they know the why. But it starts with being open-minded and, you know, checking egos at the door. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things is, you know, we really believe in, in kind of a servant leadership approach and, and we value humility. And I think that's one of the things that has allowed us to really challenge each other and, and really built a self-governing team that, you know, my team members hold me accountable and I invite them to hold me accountable. And if I can't be held accountable, I shouldn't be here, um, in my opinion. So that, that was the one thing I would say I believe in. I think it's important for people. Perfect. Jeff, thank you. That was, that was really insightful. And uh, 
we, we, we are out of time. I want to thank you for joining us here in Disrupt. But before you go, you know, when Jeff Chandler isn't hop dotting a hop dotted burger, what, what burger does, does Jeff Chandler eat? You know, I, I'm, I'm in the camp of a, you know, probably an in and out burger. Um, I like what they stand for. I like the simplicity of their ingredients and their menu. I love their consistency. You know, I can, it, so probably in and out. Okay, great. There you go. If anyone's wondering that, if you've ever wondered that before, you've got the answer. Um, Jeff, th thanks, thanks so much for joining us on Disrupt today. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I don't know if, you, if, you, if you're open for it, but uh, you reckon you might be able to make it to our uh, live event in October in Palm Springs this year? I, I, that's I, I would love spot. that. That's, that's, that's been on my list for years. I, I definitely am planning on coming. Perfect. Well, can't wait to see you there, Jeff. Otherwise, have a great weekend and uh, onward to all the other amazing things that you have happening at HopDotty. Thanks. Well, th thank you, Jason. Thanks for everybody listening. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, everybody out there for listening. That was episode eight of Disrupt. Really happy to have you here. And as I just mentioned, we're coming back in person. We've been doing all this virtual stuff for a while now, but we are making a return to our in-person event, In The Flesh event in October, 17th to 19th to be exact. We're gonna be meeting in Palm Springs and we'd love to see you there. If you are designing, building, rolling out restaurants, head to the link over here on the right-hand side in the chat and you can request an invite. But we are getting the conversation rolling before we come together in person. We are, by popular demand, bringing back our Mastermind series. This is something that we were running through the pandemic when we couldn't meet in person. Uh, and we're doing it again in summer. We are returning next Wednesday. What is the Mastermind Series? Well, these are digital roundtables. So we get you in with a small group of your peers. It's an intimate, it's a candid, it's a productive discussion about a challenge that you might be facing right now. Um, we've had a great response to it. And it's just a great way to start rubbing shoulders safely, virtually, before you meet your people in person in October. So if you're interested in that, we're kickstarting that again on Wednesday, we're going to be talking about experimenting with different restaurant formats for a changed customer this coming Wednesday on July 14th. So head to the link that we're going to put up over here on the right hand side again, and you can check out the sessions that we have running through July and August. Hopefully we'll see you there. And that is basically all we have time for on Disrupt. That's enough of my voice. I know I'm sick of it. But before you go, a quick plug for who we have coming on next week. Next week on Disrupt, episode nine, we'll be talking with Peter Shiala, who is the president and chief operating officer of Delos. And he's going to be coming on to talk to us about the International Well Building Institute's Well Health Safety Rating, which is a very confusing and mysterious sentence. And you can find out more about it next week when we talk to Peter live right here on LinkedIn, 1 p.m. Eastern. I can't wait to see you there. Have a great weekend and I'll talk to you next week. I'm gonna act up. I'm gonna need you to back up. I'm gonna need you to back up. Yep. I'm gonna need you to back up.